أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عاهدوا الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected elders, sisters and brothers سلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته this particular individual is considered as one of the four that Jannah yearns towards and aspires to meet. A warrior who stood loyal to Rasulullah as well as Imam Ali, peace and blessings be upon them. And an individual who's considered one of the main Shias of Imam Ali salam, who refused to give allegiance to anyone else after the Prophet's sad demise. Al-Maqdad ibn al-Aswad also known as Maqdad ibn Umar, is a well-established companion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, who indeed has earned much praise in narrations and holds a high status in Islamic history, respected and revered by both Sunnis and Shias alike. Indeed, when you and I examine how a group of people were presented with an opportunity to either excel or be condemned, in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them at the time when they were able to see and interact with the best of his creation. They either seized this glorious opportunity or unfortunately let it go and succumb to their desires and ambitions. They were either given tawfiq to have self-discipline and obedience to Allah and his messenger or they followed their desires and indeed followed what they wanted to do rather than what they ought to be doing. They had the opportunity to choose Akhirah over dunya and not every one of them in fact did so. Al-Maqdad ibn al-Aswad was amongst the most outstanding Sahaba companions of the Holy Prophet as well as Imam Ali salam. And one of the companions that we revere and we respect and indeed we talk about as a role model, as an exemplar that you and I need to indeed understand his life and whatever lessons that we can apply into our own lives. He was one of the early vanguards who stood firm and remained true to Islam's principles and hence we must never shy away from the recognition and the praise that he deserves. But one stop at the way that Miqdad is mentioned by the Holy Prophet وسلم, specifically highlights his status, his worth. Shaykh al Mufid narrates that the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him and his, message, and his family, has said that Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered me to love four people, specifically Ali, Salman, Miqdad, and Abadar. When we look at these narrations, it doesn't necessarily mean that only four should be loved, but it refers to degrees of love that is higher perhaps than others. Imam Sadiq salam narrates that Iman had 10 degrees, Miqdad had eight of those 10, Abadar had nine, and Salman is at the 10th. In the Holy Six Imam also narrates that it's an obligation to love people who did not deviate from the right path after the Holy Prophet. And then he mentions these people include Salman, Abadar, and Miqdad. This is a glimpse of where Miqdad stands in Islamic history, how we honor and how we revere this particular honorable. Let's have a look briefly in this holy month of Ramadan and indeed learn from the illustrious life of Miqdad. His actual name was Miqdad ibn Umar, and he was born 16 years after the year of the elephant, Amul Fil. Therefore, he was 16 years younger than the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family. 
He initially lived in an area known as Hadramaut, which is present in modern day Yemen. And on one day, he had a quarrel with a man by the name of Abu Shimr ibn Hijr. And unfortunately, this resulted in the stabbing of Abu Shimr, and Al Maqdad decided to run away towards Mecca as that tribe wanted to somehow capture him and to uh, place some revenge on him. In Mecca, he aligned himself with Bani Zuhra, the tribe of Bani Zuhra, the head of the tribe being a man by the name of Aswad, Aswad ibn Abd Yahuth. Now, this is the reason why he is known as Miqdad ibn al Aswad, because he had aligned himself with this particular tribe who would look after him in Mecca. But Miqdad was an individual who did not just let the status quo around him, you know, um, pass by without asking, without contemplating, without reflecting. Miqdad despised the practices of the Jahiliyyah, the worshipping of the idols, the eating of the God that they produce and they make out of dates. And so he began to ask questions. And it was a moment of great joy that he had an association with Ammar ibn Yasir radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi. And Ammar took him to meet the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this famous place known as Darul Arqam, whereby he listened to the Holy Prophet, whereby he was immediately inspired by the recitation of the Holy Quran and the beautiful teachings of the religion of Islam. He embraced the religion and became amongst the early vanguards and the early companions of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny. But due to the sheer pressure and the persecution of the Muslims by Quraysh, he and a number of other Muslims left towards the land of Abyssinia, the land of Habasha. And he was supposed to be there in order to be looked after by the Najashi, this just Christian king who welcomed them. And after the famous encounter whereby Ja'far al-Tayyar, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib ta'ala alayhi, recites for him verses from Surah Maryam, as we all have heard many a times, the Muslims settled there peacefully and were protected by this particular king of Abyssinia. Yet, what happened was, that Miqdad heard this rumor that in Mecca, the Quraysh have submitted to the Holy Prophet and that Islam is spreading. And this was a false rumor, but he was not to know. So therefore he decided to come back to Mecca. When he reached Mecca, he realized that that was not the case. When the Holy Prophet left for Yathrib, later known as Medina, Miqdad remained in Mecca. We don't know why, but he followed a bit later and he joined a expedition or a caravan that was being uh, targeted by Hamza radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi and then returned and then went to Medina with the uncle of the holy prophet he established himself there and he began to prepare for jihad for the struggle with the holy prophet against the enemies of the religion but his stance in badr remains as one of his great legacies because this was such a pivotal moment in Islamic history. Badr was the first battle that the Muslims had to fight and of course it was an early time, it was the second year after Hijrah and what we find is that the Muslims, some of them were hesitant. The Holy Prophet gathers them and asks them what should be happening. He says to them, Hadihi Mecca, this is Mecca. They have gathered all these people, the main of his people. What do you say we should do in as far as fighting them? And the history records, Sunni and Shia, that when it came to the first who spoke, were the first Khalifa Abu Bakr and the second Khalifa Umar, who came forward and said, Quraysh is usually not defeated. It's well known to stand strong. In other words, what they were saying is, let's not fight them, because it is likely that we will not be able to defeat them. But that is the moment that Miqdad shone. He rose to the responsibility. It was Miqdad who came forward and said these memorable words. Mark these words. Yes, Miqdad said, Ya Rasulallah, amdhi lima amarak Allah. Ya Rasulallah, go 
with whatever Allah has commanded you. فَنَحْنُ معك. We are with you. والله لا نقول لك كما قالت بنو إسرائيل لموسى. We will never say to you what the children of Israel said to Moses. اذهب أنت وربك فقاتل إنها هنا قاعدون. They said to Moses, go, you and your Lord fight. We will wait here. بل نقول, we will say to you, يا رسول الله, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتل إنا معكما مقاتلون. Go, you and what your Lord and fight. We will fight with you. الله أكبر. مقداد بن الأسود made his mark in history. This is not a simple statement, right? This is a statement that oozed positivity and courage and valor and enthusiasm. It motivated the Muslims, right? And the Holy Prophet of Islam was delighted. The other Muslims, the other Ansar specifically, the helpers, later wished that they had said what Miqdad had said. And they actually began to call Miqdad Sahib al maqal al Mahmud. You are the person who said the statement that was praiseworthy. In Badr, when he began to fight, it is narrated that Miqdad was the only horseman. He was the only one amongst the Muslims who had a horse. And his horse was known as Subayha. In other words, something that floats. And this is because of the way Maqdad used to fight in the battlefield. He would float from one area to another. He was known for his courage, yes, and he fought tremendously and defended the Holy Prophet and indeed was instrumental alongside Amir al-Mu'mineen, peace and blessings be upon him, in the Muslims attaining victory in Badr. In Hunayn, Muqdad ibn al-Aswad was amongst those who stood next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alongside Amir al-Mu'mineen and attained many wounds. A key lesson that we derive from the stance of Muqdad is this, that sometimes shaitan places fear in the hearts of people, especially believers. When they're about to, for example, do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded them to do. When it comes to righteous deeds, noble projects, charitable objectives, there is always the fear. I may not succeed. And people will put me down. This will never work. This will never happen. I have too many forces against me. I have to work on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the worth of this life? We try our best as long as it's in line with Islamic teachings, especially if it is through the guidance of our ulama, we learn to be able to grasp. Because sometimes life is full of opportunities. When we're given opportunities, we either take them or unfortunately miss the chance to excel. Miqdad took his opportunity so well. He was known also for his wise words, his ability to change the hearts of people. He was not only a warrior in the battlefield, but also instrumental in winning hearts and minds. For example, once in an expedition, one of the disbelievers by the name of al hakab ibn Kaysan is, kept, is captured and refused to become a Muslim. And the second Khalifa Umar decided to behead him. But Miqdad said, before you do that, let me speak to him about the beauty of Islam and the greatness of Rasulullah. And after he had this conversation, that man by the name of al hakam embraced Islam and his life was indeed spared. We must never give up on people. Miqdad teaches us that sometimes it's those words that make a difference. Musa السلام, is told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to Fir'aun, he's the man who is saying, Ana rabbukum ala, but see, speak to him softly. Fakula lahu qawlan layyina. We never know. We look at every individual as a potential, as an individual who could be guided, who could be indeed illuminated Allahu waliyu alladheena amanu yukhrijuhum min adh-dhulumati ila an-nur yes this taken out from the darkness is plural to the light singular in Medina once he was sitting next to a well-known sahabi by the name of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf Abdul Rahman asks Miqdad why don't you get married Miqdad said fine why don't you marry me your daughter Subhanallah, Abdul Rahman probably felt in a position where he wished he'd never asked that question, isn't it? You and I have been perhaps in those situations. He turned away from Miqdad. He did not wish to give his daughter to Miqdad. Miqdad went to the Holy Prophet and explained to him what happened. 
The Holy Prophet said to him, ولكن, لكنني أزوجك ضباعة بنت الزبير ابن عبد المطلب. I'm going to marry you to a lady by the name of Dhuba'a, who is the daughter of Zubair, who is the son of Abd al-Muttalib. In other words, she is the cousin of the Holy Prophet. And yes, some people perhaps thought that this might not work. It's a mismatch. Maybe they considered that marriage would only work in accordance with class or with accordance to status. But Rasulullah would shatter this. He said, I married Duba'a to Miqdad so that people can be encouraged to marry daughters regardless of lineage and prestige that they have. These were the reported words of the Holy Messenger of God. And indeed, this sets a very important example in today what is known as the intra-cultural marriages. Because what we find, unfortunately, is that sometimes there is resistance to this despite the challenges that such marriages pose. There is no doubt. I deal with these cases often frequently. And you know, people from different backgrounds get to know each other and become interested in marrying each other because we live in a multicultural society and some parents don't like it, understandably. But they need to also understand where their sons or daughters are coming from. If that person's akhlaq and that person's religiosity or tadayyun or their adherence to religion is something that is acceptable, that's something that they are at least happy with, then they should think twice about creating barriers. Because often what happens is that the couple decide to get married. And when it is not logical based on the idea that their other person is from a different culture, it might create resentment. And I have been in situations where the daughter specifically asks, can I get married regardless if my father is rejecting only because this person is not from my culture? Of course, our ulama have come forward and said that this is not a reason normally to reject an individual or to stop a marriage from happening. Sometimes we have to reform our ideas. Sometimes we have to reform the way we think. We're different. We're living in different times now. We wish to have whatever our forefathers and our parents would do and have. And we wish often to have our sons and daughters marry within our culture. Of course, this doesn't mean that marrying outside the culture may not have its own challenges. It does. And sometimes it, it can potentially be problematic if people are not willing to somehow sacrifice and compromise when it comes to the way different cultures do things. But if they're willing to do so, then it can be a potentially successful marriage if they submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this marriage of Dhuba'a and Miqdad would bring forth uh, two children by the name of Abdullah and Karima. Unfortunately though, Abdullah fought alongside Aisha in the Battle of Jaman against Imam Ali السلام, and was killed in the battle. And when Imam Ali السلام, looked at his corpse, he said to him, you are indeed a bad nephew. Sometimes, unfortunately, this happens. We work hard, we invest, as long as we put in the effort, as long as we try to bring up our children and the tarbiyah is of the best possible way, then sadly, sometimes the uh, children may not be of the caliber that we wish, and sometimes even go completely astray. Indeed, Miqdad became known as one of the Shia of Amir al muminin during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet himself. Imam Sadiq salam would come forward and say, I swear to by Allah that nobody acted upon Ayatul Mawadda except seven people, including Al-Maqdad. He saw the merits and the status of Imam Ali salam during the life of the Holy Prophet and therefore attached himself to him at that time and after the Holy Prophet left this world. In this famous incident, one day Miqdad was hungry. He was not able to feed his own family. And he sees Imam Ali alayhi salam. And then Miqdad does not um, greet Imam the way Imam normally expects greetings from Miqdad. And so recognizes there is a problem. Says to Miqdad, what is the problem? He says, my family is hungry. And Imam had borrowed some money. So he gives it to Miqdad and says, go you and buy some food for your family. Later on, Imam Amir al muminin in Masjid al-Nabawi is told by the Holy Prophet that he wants to eat together with him and Sayyidah Fatima. And Imam knows that there is no food at home, yet welcomes the Holy Prophet. And when the Prophet goes home, after Salatul Isha, 
Fatima al-Zahra al-Batul salawatu Allahi wa salamu alayha raises her hand in the area that she prepares the food and prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rizq and Allah tabarak wa ta'ala brings forth through the malaika this food from Jannah in which she presents before the Holy Prophet and Rasulullah explains to them that this is due to the sacrifice and the altruism displayed by the commander of the faithful when he gave his money to Miqdad. So Miqdad would see this and would recognize this and would understand the path of righteousness and the truth. And that's why when it was announced that the first Khalifa was Abu Bakr, he refused to give bayah. Forty men went to Imam Ali alayhi salam's house and said, we are ready to defend you. Imam Ali Salam said to them, if you're truly saying what you mean and are ready to sacrifice, then I want you to demonstrate this pledge. Tomorrow, I want to see you shaving your head. Next day, only three individuals from those 40 shaved the head. Salman, Abu Dhar, and of course, Miqdad, Radwanullahi Ta'ala, alayhim. He remained on this stance on every single occasion when it came to the caliphate of the first and the second and the third. And when, for example, there was six people chosen to select a Khalifa after Umar ibn al-Khattab, he made an important statement. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was somebody who said to Imam Ali, السلام, remember Abdul Rahman was the man who refused to give his daughter to Miqdad. He said to Imam Ali السلام, I will pledge my allegiance to you if you follow the book of Allah, the sunnah of the Holy Prophet and the practice of Abu Bakr and Umar, al Shaykhan. Imam Ali السلام, he said, I will only follow the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Holy Prophet. Abu Rahman said, and I will not support you. Miqdad was there. Then he looked at him and said, I swear by Allah, you have left Ali, who rules by the truth and justice. I saw no household so oppressed as the Ahl al-Bayt of the Holy Prophet after the demise of the Messenger of God. That is why there is this beautiful narration that the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings be upon him, comes forward and says, Ala anna al-jannah tashtaqat ila arba'a min ashabi. Paradise yearns and desires specifically four of my companions. فَأَمَرَنِي رَبِّي أَنْ أُحِبَّهُمْ My Lord has commanded me that I love them. They are Ali, Al-Maqdad, Salman, and Abu Dhar. What does it mean that the Jannah yearns? What does it mean that the Jannah wishes? It means that they have reached such a caliber that they are so suitable, but more than suitable for paradise. To the extent that paradise, yes, wants them to be there. Cannot wait until these individuals are, you know, honoring Jannah, yes, subhanAllah, in that particular manner. What is also important to mention regarding the Miqdad ibn al-Aswad is the fact that he was considered amongst the elite God, the Shurtat al-Khamis of the commander of the faithful, peace and blessings be upon him. Now, who are these Shurtat al-Khamis? You might come across this particular term regarding some of the companions of Imam Ali alayhi salam, where they were a group of devoted fighters at the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam, who had dedicated their lives to the support of the Imam. You know, the, the word Shurtat literally means a group, an army, a, 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 an association, so to speak. Um, and they were ready to sacrifice themselves. Um, Miqdad was amongst those, you know, um, they were willing to do whatever it takes. Yes. And they were divided into five um, sections. That's why they're called the army or the guard that were five, because the, they were divided into groups of forerunners, the front, the right wing, the left wing, and the heart. Yes. And some ulama say that uh, they were perhaps thousands in number, whereas others have disputed this. But it is those that Imam Ali alayhi salam approved of and indeed praised. 
and they possessed some attributes including being constantly ready and equipped and having constant companionship with Imam Ali salam. In the battles, they used to fight in the front lines. They were always ready to serve Imam Ali salam and never delayed obeying the Imam's orders. They, um, for example, had promised to be loyal to Imam to the death. They had detached themselves from this world and were knowledgeable as well as pious men. They belonged to various tribes and even when there were no battles, like in the instance of Miqdad, they were ready and accompanied Imam and indeed executed important missions. Whatever the Imam would tell them, they would indeed do. And Miqdad perhaps was at the heart of this particular establishment, the elite guard of the commander of the faithful. That's why when it comes to his life, yes, we recognize there are an important number of lessons to be learned. Number one, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would facilitate certain things for us if we are submissive and we are patient and we search and look for the truth. Look at Miqdad. He had to leave his village or area and tribe and eventually ended up with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some people say circumstances led him there. No, there was a plan. If we submit, sometimes certain things don't work out according to our plan, but maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a better plan for us. Another key lesson to learn from Miqdad is the importance of obedience and recognizing the correct leadership and not to go with whims and desires and to speak the truth and to stand up for justice. Yes and to be of those individuals who does, does not somehow succumb to pressures of society just because everybody else is pushing and calling for certain aspects. Another lesson that can be learned from the life of Miqdad ibn al-Aswad is the need to sometimes look for avenues and support when it comes to certain moments. When he reached Mecca, he was not somebody who left himself by himself. He went and looked for some group to protect and support. Today, for example, some of our youth have some wonderful ideas, have some initiatives, but they can't necessarily execute this by themselves. So they need to look for like-minded individuals. They need to find support in other individuals. If they want to make a group, for example, to, for instance, organize certain events. Like-minded individuals want to be positive, who will forgive when people make mistakes. And so on that particular basis, uh, you know, the inspiration from Miqdad is to constantly look for those avenues and for individuals who might provide the, like, the, the right logistics and areas in which we can indeed benefit from. Unfortunately, Maghdad ibn al-Aswad was not able to remain alive to see the wonderful government of Imam Ali alayhi salam, was not able to fight alongside him in the battles of Jamal, Safin, and indeed Nahrawan. And in the year 33 after Hijrah, Maghdad leaves this world in an area known as Jurf, and his body is carried towards the land of Baqir, where he is buried. Fortunately today, if you ask and if you go to Jannatul Baqir and you're seeking and you're wanting to find the grave of Miqdad, there is no trace for it. It has not been unfortunately preserved throughout history, but we know that he is indeed buried there. One of the most noble, respected, revered, loved and honored companions of the Holy Prophet, as well as Imam Ali, peace and blessings be upon them. And indeed, when we remember Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this holy month of Ramadan to accept our deeds and to grant us the opportunity to implement those lessons into our lives. Sometimes we have to make notes. Sometimes we have to have a plan of action. Sometimes we have to speak about these individuals with our family members, with others. These stories are influential, inspirational, and indeed they are motivational for us to instigate that change that we need to constantly make this month of Ramadan in our lives in order for us to keep, keep progressing and to attain the mercy and the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the shafa'a from the Ahl al-Bayt. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallillahumma wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ahli baytihat tayyibin al-tahirin.
Thank you.